Hey, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to talk about uh, audio effects, which is kind of an important thing in the world of audio. I hope you're all doing well, and I'd like to just go ahead and dive into this topic with a quick introductory line. So, what's an audio effect? Well, it's pretty simple. You take an input sound and you modify it, and then you output the modified version. Really, no more. That. Uh, so why is this worth a whole week of study? Well, because it gets a little bit complicated. First thing you should understand is that all the audio you hear, all the recorded and transmitted audio that you hear, basically anything that's not you in the room, can heavily affects process any kind of uh, modern equipment. The uh, commercial, the the consumer equipment does automatic bunch of effects to try to make things sound better and in a commercial environment there's going to be some fairly heavy man manually applied effects to make it work i thought it might be fun to show you the effects chain that i'm using with obs so i'm going to try to get obs enough on the screen to actually do that here um because yeah for this i'm using quite a bit um get some interesting effects here Let's see, uh, let's open our filters. And I've got three things. I've got a noise suppression filter, which suppresses noise below a certain level so that you don't hear it at all. That means that background noise is only present when I'm actually also talking, which makes it sound quite a bit better. Uh, you hear that the noise goes up for a moment. And I've got a noise gate, which, oh, sorry, this is noise suppression. This actually just tries to reduce noise by doing some clever. The noise gate is the thing that stops the sound. Silence is supposed to And then I've got a compressor. And I'll talk later about what a compressor is. But the basic idea, we've talked about it a little bit. The basic idea is to make some soft sounds sound louder so the sound sounds more uniform. So I actually saw that compressor kick out a little bit. Eight. Open the noise gate out more so the open threshold is a lower noise level and the closed threshold is a lower noise level. I'm also going to adjust the attack time a little bit to get this thing to actually be able to hold open and and uh, actually work the way it's supposed to. I really don't want to gate off my actual audio, so I'm trying to be really careful about that. So um, now we've got some effects here. Let's see what it sounds like with them all turned off. This is what the sound would sound like if I didn't do any of those things and just recorded the sound. And you know, you can hear that it still sounds fine but you'll get a lot more variation between soft and loud volume levels, and you'll get a lot more noise. You can hear the background noise when I stop talking, and there's quite a bit of it. So yeah, um, that's, uh, that's audio signal processing. Uh, this is a pretty simple chain. There's nothing very fancy in it, and yet it's enough to get me a long ways in this business here. Let me close that back up, get this screen out of our way, and we'll talk about some more things. So, you know, the, the thing is that it, the reason that they do that partly is because it makes things sound better, but also part of the reason it sounds bad is because to a modern ear, you expect to hear that stuff. It's an expected part of the recorded sound experience, and you'll be your ear will be surprised if you're not hearing those kinds of things going on. Uh, and the artistic effects, you know, there's also obviously artistic effects, which are done not just to make sound sound better, but to sound different. Music is full of effects of various kinds. And again, any electronic music, you know, electronically recorded music you have has probably got a whole bunch of effects to make the music better and maybe veering into some really funky territory. Uh, the um, classic example is the auto tuner, which about 20, 25 years ago, was a thing that would actually try to pitch shift, which we'll talk about later in this course, 
the singer's voice so that if they strayed off key a little bit, they weren't off key anymore. It turns out that it's easier to find attractive, charismatic people who can sort of sing than fantastic singers who are also sort of charismatic and attractive. And so, yeah, the whole industry got built for a while around sort of massive application of auto-tuning. And then somebody noticed that if you set the auto-tuner settings right, it would make a kind of a warbly thing going down or up as you glided your voice up. And that became an effect that got way overused for about a 10 or a 15 year period. So, you know, it's all kind of the same stuff at some level. So I plan to talk for the next several lectures about audio effects. But what I wanted to do today just to get started is to talk about uh, sort of the high level view of effects and what's going on uh you know the, the main thing is that there's you know effects are challenging they they are more challenging than it looks like they ought to be on the surface uh the first challenge is real time the you know it's one thing to design effects digital effects that happen post-processing that's actually a lot easier but if you're going to do it real time first of all you have to have adequate throughput but that's pretty easy The you know modern cpus are great unless you know you're on some kind of sad little dsp part that costs a dollar you know some sad little microprocessor that costs a dollar that's built into your consumer equipment it's going to have some challenges keeping up with a 48,000 sample per second audio stream sometimes latency is a bigger deal and the, the latency problem you've know, talked about it before you know you really can't tolerate that much latency to begin with and the problem with effects is as we'll talk about in a moment, you saw how we had three of them chained together. Each one introduces its own latency. And so when you start talking about the latencies through the system, if you have a long fancy effects chain, the effects latency may start to dominate the other latencies in the system. And that's kind of a bad situation if you're trying to do anything in real time, if you're trying to hear yourself sing, if you're trying to match voice with video, that kind of stuff. Um, the, the real-time effects and the offline effects, again, blur together. Most of offline effects are actually designed to work as real-time effects, but, you know, it's interesting to think about what you can do if you have more than one second to process a second of audio. Yeah, the, the, the hardware, you know, the, the hardware that they run on these days is, you know, very simple. In the old days, there really weren't digital audio. We've talked about that before. And so they would build these effects out of analog. Your noise gate and your noise suppressor and your compressor were all built out of just discrete parts. And they'd have a bunch of knobs and stuff. And that was challenging. And now you have these tiny microcontrollers. That's challenging too. Another big challenge is just the complexity of managing an effects chain like this. You really want a lot of control, especially as a serious audio engineering type person over everything that these each of these effects can do but the knobs add up there's sort of a lot of knobs and by the end of the day you know the it can be really hard to figure out what knobs you should turn you saw me messing around just now i just switched microphones you saw me messing around just now trying to make sure that the audio would be audible for you all the way through and it was a lot of knobs and they interact in interesting ways um Another thing is that, you know, there's effects that are sort of practical effects like compression. There's effects that are sort of synthetic effects like uh, distortion. And then there's the modeling effects. And that's probably the hardest class of effects. The idea here is that you put sound through some effects process that makes it sound like it came through something else or from something else. So it's very common to try to take an inexpensive microphone and make it sound like some fancy $5,000, $10,000 microphone by doing an effect that is the emulate the new microphone, the good microphone effect. The same kind of thing with amplifiers and speaker cabinets and that kind of stuff. There's a whole industry around trying to provide good emulations of those things so that I can run a dry signal obtained from cheap hardware through them and get the effect of owning really expensive, rare, boutique hardware. The other class is sort of room effects. That's pretty common. I'd really like it to sound like I'm in a concert hall, but I'm not in a concert hall. 
I want my voice to sound like it's coming over the telephone. And that was more of a big deal, of course, when telephone voice was a lot more distinctive, but even now it's a thing. Well, I'm gonna have to think about how to do that. And I'm probably not gonna do it by recording through a telephone. I'm probably gonna do it by getting some cleaner, better auto audio signal and then trying to telephone out. And the thing is, as I keep saying over and over, effects come in chains. There's a lot of effects typically that get put together. And so you build essentially this um, directed acyclic graph of effects where you know effects are chained together in chains. You might split the signal at some point and send it through two chains of effects. It's always gonna be sort of an acyclic graph normally because things get really weird when you feed back but it can be a pretty complicated graph. And of course, one of the advantages of digital is that splitting a signal is really easy. I don't have to worry about the things I have to worry about in the analog world with impedance matching and blah, blah, blah. But you know, just like in the analog world, I still have to think about what happens when I wanna bring two signals together, right? It's mixing signals sounds easy. Mixing is essentially an effect and there's a lot of knobs that you might wanna include there and a lot of things you might wanna be careful about. One of the, you know, one of the things is that typically audio is stereo. I'm in the fortunate situation of processing mostly mono audio today but you know if you're processing stereo then you want to keep the channels matched up and you want to usually apply similar effects to both channels but not always sometimes you want the left to sound different than the right and the other thing is sort of latency matching through these DAGs if I have a long chain and a short chain and then I mix the outputs together well I really want the mixed signal to have that you know sort of outputs come from the same time points. And so now I really have to match the latencies of those chains, which can be really super challenging. So there's a lot of hard stuff there. Um, it makes things exciting. And like I say, there's just so many different knobs. There's so many different displays uh, in this equipment that you really want to, first of all, when you've set 30 knobs, you'd like to be able to save those settings and then you'd like to be able to restore them. And that sounds simple too. You have a save button or a store button, you save all the settings, digital's easy. But, you know, maybe not all the settings, right? Because there's some things like the master volume that you're almost certainly not gonna wanna put back to exactly where it just was. And now you have some complicated sort of UI reasoning. And the thing is at the end of the day too, what you'd like to have your nice digital equipment do that's very hard for analog equipment, which mostly has mechanical devices, potentiometers in it. You'd like your digital equipment to be able to sort of have meta knobs so that, it, you know, instead of having to, you know, sort of shift things one at a time, I can sort of shift things or change things, you know, in batches. And so I can have one knob that goes from this part of the song to that part of the song in a smooth way as I turn it. And that kind of stuff is doable, but it takes a lot of thinking about how to do it and how to configure it. I mean, I'll talk next time about plugins and effects racks, which are sort of the classic digital way of emulating what we used to do with analog hardware, where you'd literally have a rack full of effects and you would cable them together. And, you know, there's a lot of open questions about user interface, about the best way to organize this and the best way to configure it. And I feel like it's sort of a more challenging area of audio than most people realize. So I wanted to end with sort of a discussion of a particular effect. We've talked about compression before. Um, compression is probably one of the simplest effects that we could possibly apply to an audio signal. We try to hold the output volume level more steady as a function of the input volume. And there's of course expansion, which is the opposite. Try to make the changes in the input volume more pronounced on the output. And the typical way of doing this is to have two different sort of linear gain functions with a knee. So you have some uh, some steep rise in, in audio volume up to some level, and then it flattens out as you get to an even higher level. And so we're gonna have this sort of bilinear transfer function, two linear transfer function. And you gotta be careful about that knee, because if you switch at the knee, it you can't do it instantaneously a lot of times because the signal will distort. So you usually have some way of slowly moving up to the upper curve and back to the lower curve over time. 
as you get louder and softer. And, uh, you know, like it, this is a very, very ubiquitous effect, like we've talked about before. Uh, it absolutely is applied to almost everything. It sounds professional, whatever that means. And always high volume is desirable in a lot of applications, having a high steady volume. Uh, I've written a little demo compressor, uh, which you might want to take a look at, which is sort of a very simple Python implementation of this compression idea. And it goes for, it's an offline one. It goes from a wave file to another wave file and applies a very simple uh, compression effect. I feel like, you know, that's a good place to start in some ways because that compressor was more challenging to write than I thought it would be. There's a lot of any, everything's hard in this situation. And so, you know, there's, we'll look over the next while at a little bit more about effects architecture in the next lecture and eventually talk about a whole bunch of specific effects and how they work. And at the end of that, what tends to happen for me is I get sort of overwhelmed with a million pieces of very complicated information. And this stuff is the stock and trade of the audio engineer. As computer scientists, I feel like we have a role in making better architectural decisions and building better user interfaces and thinking hard about how best to use our computational resources of latency and bandwidth to uh, make this whole process work better. Uh, and so that's going to be kind of what I'll talk about as we go forward with this series of talks. Thank you very much for listening. I hope it was helpful. I hope you're doing well out there and I will talk to you again soon.